Hi there, it's Carl Irwin, The Common Magician, with a short little talk here today about the perfect crime. The perfect crime. Um, this um, came up uh, in my thinking here uh, recently. I put out a uh, new product called Spare Key. Very open. It is a, it's a look at the double card, the double thick card, key card um, principle, that gaff, that particular gaff that is not used as widely as it probably could or should be, maybe, is uh, a, a very good kind of uh, gaffed card or a gimmicked card uh, to keep in, in a deck of cards to use as a key. Um, it can be handled <clears throat> by a spectator, uh, shuffled in certain ways, and then uh, uh, still controlled by the performer uh, and used as as a card of interest or used as a key card against cards of interest or whatever. A lot of different uses for it. So I put up a $10 download on Penguin uh, concerning that particular gaff. There's other uh, products out there that talk about the gaff, but I just share uh, on my download the way I like to make it uh, and why I like to make it the way I do. Uh, and then my favorite uses, which are slightly less orthodox and typical than, than the common uses. And I look at the common uses too. But anyway, I posted uh, a couple of, you know, little trailer example videos for that. And uh, I got one comment on one of them that was, uh, you know, critical of the performance uh, in an unfortunate way, given that it was a trailer. Um, and there's nothing wrong with the criticism itself. The criticism was like, I don't like, I think that, uh, it was... Um, uh, I don't, uh, I don't like your, I don't like your washes, your table wash. I have to do a table wash in it. That's part of the teaching there is talking about the table wash using a key card. And, um, and then it also, uh, part of that was, uh, there are hundreds of ways to do this. I would do it this way. The simplest is the best. Just kind of, kind of a, a treatment, uh, as if it was a work in progress kind of demonstration video rather than the trailer for a product that it was. So, uh, nothing against the criticism. I think there was a context in which there's nothing wrong with that at all. Uh, just kind of voicing. I mean, that's what this channel is about. People voice their opinions about what I do all the time. But given the fact that it was a trailer for a product and I, it's people are going to be pointed there, I didn't really want that kind of a <laughs> take on it as, you know, comment number one. So I, I did delete the comment after a little bit of a back and forth. But I wanted to talk about uh, some of what I think is behind that sort of observation There's again, there's nothing wrong with those kinds of observations at all, but there is something that drives it that really makes this sort of observation somewhat irrelevant in many cases. It, it, you have to kind of be self-critical and determine for yourself whether or not it's it's valid. But um, and I I will call this talk the the search for the perfect crime, the perfect crime. So if you think about uh, that term, we've heard that before. What is a perfect crime? A crime that can be committed in which uh, there is no uh, way to determine who did it, right? A who done it without the who. There's no way to figure it out. And uh, the way that you get there in a perfect crime scenario is by having no evidence, right? Typically, that's that's how you would achieve the perfect crime. There'd be no evidence of, of any sort to uh, figure out the who of the who done it. Uh, when we look at magical effects, we're really attempting to commit the perfect crime. We're trying to do some some form of deception, and the goal always is to uh, remove as much of the evidence as possible. Now, here the here's the issue. Philosophically, there is a position that there can never really be such a thing as the perfect crime because there's always evidence of what happened, how it happened, and potentially pointing back to who done it, right? Um, the only way to really have the perfect crime is to have no witness of it, um, no outcome, no n nothing nothing left over, right? If you think about this in terms of, um, this is kind of morbid, but just I think the easiest way to have the conversation. Uh, a murder is committed, right? It's not to have the body found and, you know, identify who who, who it is and uh, what their associations were and, and all this sort of stuff, which just, just becomes a snowball effect, right, in terms of evidence. But to have no body at all, right, no witness to the crime, uh, no no uh, outcome of the crime, no nothing to see, 
There's nothing to see there. There's, there's not even a conclusion that a crime has even been committed, right? That's kind of the closest you can get to the perfect crime. When we are doing a magical effect, we can never do any such thing because the point is always to see something happen, that that something has happened, uh, see it happen, and to see the outcome of what has happened and to observe it and to be amazed by that. So uh, already we have uh, the proverbial deck, stick, uh, deck, uh, deck stacked against us and we're not really able to uh, uh, commit that perfect crime. There's evidence, no matter what you do. If you do something, whatever is seen is what is done. All right? If I do a false shuffle, and if you see me do the shuffle, you will see me doing the false shuffle. You will see everything that goes into doing the false shuffle. The only way I could really do a false shuffle where the false shuffle is not seen for what it is, is if I say that I shuffled, but I don't actually show you, right? If I turn my back and I, you know, say that I shuffled the cards and put them back in front. Well, that's not believable. You have to demonstrate that the thing is happening. There has to be some kind of record and visual evidence of the thing being done. And because of that, the thing that is actually being done will always be seen for what it is. This is an old conversation we've had before. Uh, and usually this conversation turns into a, a discussion about tells, right? What are the various tells when doing some kind of slight or some kind of falsification? Um, <clears throat> I could do, I don't know, some kind of a, uh, some kind of a pass, right? I could do a, uh, uh, maybe um, a, a Herman pass, right? And I could do it like this. Uh, and there's always going to be a tell in the fact that I did the Herman Pass because uh, I'm holding it at an awkward angle, right? Magicians know that whenever they see this happening, right, whether it looks as intentional as I'm making it or whether it looks natural, uh, this is a tell of something going on. I cannot do a Herman Pass, right? Like, I cannot do a Herman Pass like this. I can start to approach doing a Herman pass like this. I can really do it if I'm like this, right? There's these different kinds of tells that are part of the thing that is being done, and that's evidence of what it is. Now, you could say that one would never notice a pass being done if the cards were held like this. But the problem with that is that a pass couldn't be done with the cards being held like this. There's going to have to be some kind of cover, misdirect, something's going to have to happen in order to get this from here under there. And it's got to go this way, it's got to go this way, it's got to go this way, it's got to go this way. And that's not a small thing, right? Something has to happen, and it has to have some sort of cover. There's going to be some sort of evidence. The thing that is happening is going to be seen as the thing that is happening, the key for us in performing an effect is that it is not recognized by the audience as the thing that is happening, but is actually misidentified as something else having happened, right? That's the best we can do. But there's never going to be an evidence-free crime scene, ever. It just isn't going to be that way. Um, it's kind of like, you know, if you're going to make the elephant disappear and you... You know, it, how do you do this? You have the elephant in the space that you're going to uh, dematerialize it from, and you put up a big curtain or, or you put it into a big box, right? I mean, you have to do that. You have to do that in order to get to the end. Um, you cannot allow the audience to see the evidence of what's going on, and the evidence becomes the box or the curtain. That's the evidence. I cannot see what's going on in this space in this moment. Now my brain is going to deduce, well, what are the options available with that kind of cover? You know, what does that cover facilitate in terms of the outcome? Uh, that is how all magical effects work. So how, how does this translate into um, this little uh, example here with table washes? So we're, we're already nearly 10 minutes into it, but in true form on the Common Magician channel, you get a speech from me before we actually do anything. So uh, that is the setup. That's the basic premise. Let's look at table washes real quick uh, because this was the, the consideration without giving up anything on my little product there. And again, it's a very open description of what the product is. You're going to understand a lot of what I'm showing in the uh, trailer. I'm, you know, it's a very honest kind of 
trailer for the product, but uh, uh, I'm not going to spell it all out for you. You got to go pay your 10 bucks to get all the details there. But let's look at some various uh, false table shuffles, right? F table washes. Uh, deck is in um, new deck order. And uh, just uh, so we have verification. So various types of table washes, and I do I do many of them. Um, there are full deck table washes. There are uh, slug or um, stack stock table washes that just retain pieces. Uh, let's just look at some of the options. So first of all, a table wash is um, just by definition... Uh, is this, so we have a deck here, table washes whenever the cards are all scrambled up on the table. I'm not insulting your intelligence, I know that, but just for uh, a, a you know demonstration. This is the table wash, and obviously you wouldn't overdo it. Uh, you might pick up some cards and put them in different, you know, different part in the stack there, make sure that bottom cards don't remain on the bottom, top cards don't remain on the top. That's a table wash. So what we're trying to do is falsify that. Right, we're trying to make a falsification of that particular uh, sort of uh, visual. So we have this uh, deck in stack. Uh, one way to do this is uh, the Leonard Green sort of way, uh, which is to make a cycle. And what you do is you just keep everything in the cyclical pattern. So you could tuck the top card under the bottom card, and you have a step sequence all the way through. Right, so the cards are in sequence, and then what you can do is you can close down that opening in the center and just move everything in a cyclical pattern, right? Uh, and it really doesn't matter where it breaks open, uh, but you just kind of shuffle everything back underneath step by step uh, until you get it uh, all back in order again. And then it's a matter of just opening up and cutting to the proper face card, right? So that is probably the most basic, generic kind of false table wash that you can do, right? The, the Leonard Green kind of um, wheel uh, a pattern, right? Um, he's very comical about doing it, uh, and he has a whole kind of context in his routine about chaos and all this sort of thing. You've all seen it before. Um, that is the, that's kind of the basic, the basic premise of the false table wash for a full deck, right? How can you improve that a little bit? This is one we've looked at on the channel before. Um, this is how I improve upon it. Uh, you do the same kind of thing, and you can tuck underneath here. And what I do is I close everything down, and then I push. This is the the, the bottom and the top are now uh, uh, stepped. What I do is I push the top and the bottom section that have been stepped together out, and it opens up the middle, and then I push it outward. So what it ends up looking like is not kind of a wheel pattern, but sort of a, a pile that gets shoved and pushed in different directions. And now you're in sort of the zipper kind of formation where I actually have a step pattern going up and coming down here. And what I can do is once I've done that and I've opened up the center of it, I can uh, put this together, bring this back. I can, I can push it out even further again and wheel it back around or whatever. But you're just kind of snaking this pattern around once you've broken out the center of it right, until you bring it all back together. Now, it does require that the cards can never be further than this distance out, right? I can't get a spread that goes all the way out here without having some kind of a snake pattern. If I want to have coverage where there's no opening in the center, I have to close it down to this space, and then I open it up in the center like this to uh, 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 kind of create this imagery of uh, uh, changing in uh, uh, groupings, right? That some groups are overlapping in other places and that, that possibility is there. Um, then same thing. Once I have that done, all I need to do is open this up to uh, the break and then I put it back in order. Now, of course, this can be dealt with if you add a key card of some kind. So I'm just going to put a key card in here. Uh, it gets a little close to home on the trailer there, but uh, um, uh, on the product. But this is a fair demonstration, and I've, I've used this on the channel before. Same kind of premise, right, uh, where you, you get your, your Leonard Green kind of uh, wheel going. Uh, open up the center. Uh, keep, your, keep your step in, in motion. I actually may have lost my step here, but we're going to be fair about it. Uh, there it is. Close it all up. 
And then what I can do is from this point, I can uh, uh, get my key card to put us back in order. Looks like I did get uh, something out of order. I've got an ace out of order. There you go. Okay, so that's it. One card out of order, uh, two cards out of order. Four of hearts goes there. There we go. Okay, so that is um, the same kind of idea with a key card, right? So keep a wheel, keep a step uh, alignment, uh, break it at any point, but always make sure that that step snake always stays in play. And you can kind of move them around. Now, one, one key thing about this is to not let this drag on. The longer that you do this, the more evidence can be seen, right? Do this quickly. Do it quickly. Make it simple. Uh, the very the very direct version of this is the zipper effect, which I was alluding to there and I've, I've talked about before on the channel before. That is where you dribble the cards out and back and you have kind of a V pattern. And this looks kind of like a riffle shuffle sort of situation where you can spread the cards and then you push the sides together. We're going to do the same thing, but if we start at the apex of this V out here, they will step on top of each other and maintain uh, their order, and then I can just bring them together. That's really one of my favorite ones. There's less risk involved in that, right? Uh, just go out, go out and back, uh, and then push together starting at the apex, bring it down here. Looks very, very good, uh, very, very fair looking, especially if it's done quickly, okay? Now, it's not, doesn't have that visual of the chaos of a table wash, but it does look very, very table wash-like uh, and it looks like it's sort of mimicking a riffle shuffle kind of a situation. So a couple of variations there and a couple of ways to use it. Now we can look at another option, which is where we're not maintaining the whole, the whole deck. Okay. Uh, but rather we're just going to maintain a stack, just a, a little bit of slug. Uh, we have a lot more latitude because we can actually shuffle a lot of the deck. Uh, but we have to maintain a little piece, right? So uh, that might uh, look something kind of like this, right? Where we have our, our situation here uh, and we um, just kind of shuffle, pick up some cards here. All right, chaos, get everything together. Cut. And uh, we have for aces controlled. Now, this is a particular kind of shuffle I think that was being criticized because the claim was, well, I don't really know what's, what's wrong with it, but it doesn't look right to me. Well, because it isn't right. It's false, right? There's evidence in there. You can't get around it. You know it's false. The question is, is to a person who who looks at that and knows the idea of the Vegas table wash, right? The poor man shuffle, right? The, the home game card shuffle. Um, does it look fair to them? That's the question. And I say, yes, it absolutely looks fair to them, right? It doesn't really matter how you handle it. If, it, if there's enough movement around there. And uh, uh, the, the number one thing I think that really makes this work is that you can see the, the bottom here and then you can see the top over here, right? So you see the bottom and the top. And when you see all of that get mangled up, in the shuffling, right? When you see all of that happen, it really doesn't matter uh, what else happens around it, right? As long as those key locations that you would be typically concerned about are, are mixed up, the top and the bottom, this does not seem like you could really get any sort of uh, uh, control from the deck. Um, but there it is, right? We still managed to do it. So that's that's part of it, is that what we're doing is we're controlling a chunk of cards, but not from a typical place, not from the top or the bottom, but somewhere else, somewhere kind of central to the deck, right? And that's that's one of the things I talk about on the video there. Um, but falsification of a, a, a slug, right, using some kind of a key principle uh, and, and really shuffling most of the deck. The fact that you have a group of cards being picked up and shoved into other cards that might look strange to a person that's looking for falsification, but it looks honest to somebody else, right? That doesn't, they, they'd have no idea what they're looking for. Uh, it looks it looks like a mess. It looks like chaos. So um, there's always going to be evidence. It doesn't matter what you do. You cannot, there is an option. 
and I'm not going to demonstrate it here. It's not something I do, but some people do it, where you have a group of cards that are in a location, known location, usually top or bottom. And you do you do the the spreading, and you choreograph the handling of specific cards so that you can put them into the right place, right? It's a choreography. It's a practice kind of dance with the fingers uh, so that you're doing uh, a, a, a consistent rehearsed movement of specific cards every time you do it to maintain those cards in a particular location. That's another option, right? That's another option. You can you can learn something like that. And of course, if you uh, come up with your own choreography, it'll be better than anything else. Uh, but nonetheless, there's still going to be a tell there. There's still going to be evidence. People are People are seeing you do exactly what you're doing. Right, they see you doing exactly what you're doing. Ultimately, the only way to guarantee the falsification or, or the 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 um, uh, the legitimacy rather of a table wash is for me to not wash them myself, but for me to give them to the spectator and say, "Wash the cards on the table." Right? Then the only the only possibility in a crime being committed there is that I have an accomplice, I have a confederate that's helping me out, which is less likely. Right? Um, but you know, falsifications, it, whatever you do, it, we've had this discussion about the zero shuffle and various other kinds of, you know, false deals, things like that, that are open. They're things that are done out in the open and they all have tells. They all have, they all have things that, that kind of give away what is actually happening because you're actually seeing it happen, right? It, it is an magic of this sort techniques of this sort really fall more under the classification of optical illusion than they do sleight of hand if you think about it right optical illusion more than sleight of hand if i falsify my my shuffle this is more optical illusion than it is sleight of hand because there's only so much you can see uh, there's a lot you can't see, and the fact that you can't see a lot indicates something about what is actually happening, right? It comes down to the optics of it. Does it look and sound like something familiar that you would misidentify as being a fair shuffle when in fact it is not? It is a, a controlled kind of situation. So that that is my little talk, my little spiel, spiel here about um, uh, table washes and and what they look like uh, whenever we falsify them. Um, you're never going to have a table wash that isn't at least extremely well choreographed uh, and, and limited, I think, in scope to a small slug that isn't going to be very obvious to someone that knows what's going on. You know, much like, much like that false dealing, you know, false riffle sh table riffle shuffle kind of stuff that we've talked about before. So anyway, that's my uh, that's my quick talk. Actually, this isn't too long, 20, 25 minutes, not quite, uh, on uh, table washes committing the perfect crime. Um, now, you can import this philosophy into all of your magic, right? What you're always trying to do, I think, in method is come up with something that is sufficiently deceptive, right? I just saw Joshua J do a while back a, um, on his Instagram, he did a live uh, lecture on false shuffles. And um, he talked about a wide variety of false shuffling cuts. And he made a statement that was fascinating. He was welcoming people on onto the uh, uh, channel, right? And then he he's doing some shuffling while he's talking and welcoming people on. And later on, he said something about there are a classification of false shuffles that people say, well, I just do it casually in the offbeat and it goes right by. And he, he leveled some criticism at that. He said, but why would you have, why would you work with something that requires that, that doesn't look sufficiently false um and instead you would use something that clearly does not look false and depend on the misdirection why don't you use one of these other good things that looks sufficiently false and do it on the offbeat why wouldn't you do that now my issue with what he was saying and and i love joshua jay's i mean he does he does 
he's one of the best, right? You, you know, if, if you have to listen to him or me, you need to listen to him, right? For sure. But I, but, but all's fair here. He, he got done doing, you know, one of these things that requires an enormous amount of misdirection and it has to be done in the offbeat. He, he was doing that. I, you know, he was doing one of the things that I would classify as the kind of no go scenario, right? So what I'm saying here is, is that I think there's a lot more that's fair game than what some people say, and even than what he was saying there. Literally, I think you can get away with a whole lot, but what you're trying to look for is something that is sufficiently deceptive within the appropriate context, right? If it's sufficiently deceptive in the context that's most appropriate to what it, what it is you're doing, that is... I don't want to say good enough, but it's good enough, right? That that's that's what you want, and you also want to to point to uh, something that a, a, a point he made on there is you want to probably tend towards things that are more sure fire, right? You want something that is sure fire, not only sure fire in the visual sense, but sure fire in terms of the uh, uh, risk, right? The risk outcome. You want something that's going to work when you do it, uh, which is inevitably going to create more evidence, right? If it's more surefire in terms of risk management, it's probably going to be a little bit more revealing in terms of the evidence that's there on display. Because again, everyone can see what is going on. They're just misidentifying it as something different than what it actually is. That's what, that's what slights really are. So anyway, just some food for thought, you know, some things to think about and consider. Uh, I, I'm not sure I've really taught you much here. This is stuff we've looked at before and stuff that many of you have already run into many times over. But just in terms of the criticism, um, you know, we're, we're always looking for something that is sufficient in the appropriate context. And I stand by, I stand by that key card, uh, product there with the double thick card. So, uh, I recommend it, check it out. Uh, I keep a, I keep a double thick card in most cards that I carry. I don't carry cards very often, but when I do have my own cards and I'm using my own cards in a situation, uh, uh nine times out of 10, I probably have a double thick card in there because it's such a, it's such a powerful tool. Um, and not just for this, but for a lot of other kind of very basic management, uh, concepts that that eliminate a lot of slights just you can do things much more openly with a key card such as a double thick card than you would with a, a regular deck of cards where you have to um, hold a lot of breaks and manage uh, angles and things like that you can just kind of cut things and do it openly uh, it takes a lot of the heat off so highly recommend it spare key go get it penguin magic 10 bucks pretty fair good luck with that happy magic